prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this opportunity to come together, to think about your word and to think about how we live our lives in light of it. We pray that you would be with us now. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Okay. <coughs> Here we go. This here is a very colorful picture, and it's from Luther's translation of the Bible. So this is from 1534, and you can see how it's all painted up and colored as well. You're going to see this image. It's going to pop up along the way. I just figured I'd tell you where it was from in case you're like wondering as it shows up. Okay, so, uh, as you were told, I, I'm from uh, Mount Olive in Regina, and uh, graduated here from the seminary, as well as from the Nova Scotia College of Art and Design in Halifax, and Grant McEwen uh, here in the city as well. And when I was a little kid, I went to St. Matthew Lutheran School in Stony Plain. So I was at Grant McEwen uh, in 1995, finished there in 1995, NASCAD in 1997, and it included drawing, painting, video, photography, performance art, and installation, as well as art history and film theory. So all of you guys here in the MDiv program, you've done undergraduate degrees, you all bring something from your undergraduate degree into your MDiv program, and you're going to bring that also into your time as a pastor as well. So the first degree that I did here at the seminary was finished in 2000, and that was a Master of Theological Studies degree, and I wrote a thesis called Luther's Understanding of Ecclesiastical Art and Its Proper Function in the Church, and a lot of what we're going to look at today is from that first thesis. The second degree was the MDiv degree from 2007, and that's the second thesis that I wrote then, Hearing with Your Eyes, Perception Theory, and, Luther's, uh, and Lutheran Worship and Practice. And uh, you guys are probably happy that you don't write theses anymore, but uh, I see a little, <laughs> little happiness there. It was a very good experience, I'll have to say. We have nothing to share with the rest of the world then. That's right. Who said anybody did before? <laughs> uh, Careful. Careful. <laughs> Careful. <laughs> along, along the way, uh, I had a relationship with Zion Lutheran Church in Prince George. I was a member there for a while. They asked me to design some stained glass windows for them. So they have six windows in their sanctuary. Six windows, what do you think maybe I focused it on? The six chief parts of the catechism. Two of those windows are in, one is designed and isn't completed, and uh, the project is on hold because the fabricator died of cancer. So, but it's a project that could get picked up along the way. So here's a couple pictures here, them bringing the stained glass windows in, building the stained glass windows. You see the one has got communion related theme to it, the other one is baptismal related theme. So St. Paul in Saskatoon also asked me to do some stained glass windows. This is a, a current project that's going on. Uh, I designed them, drew the drawings first, uh, it's a process where you start with the drawings, then you move to the coloration. After that, you give it to the fabricator. The fabricator starts making the actual physical windows, and then they get installed in the church. So 
So right now, there uh, quite a few of the of them have been put in. All of it's just built with the glass and the aluminum, uh, and then the script is hand drawn in and baked into the glass. Here's a side-by-side -side drawing and then the finished piece. They've got 24 of the windows in now. At St. Paul, the way that it's uh, arranged in the nave, they have six windows on one side and six on the other. So, of course, 12 disciples. And then above them, the six chief parts of the catechism shared. Right? So it's Ten Commandments, Ten Commandments, Lord's Prayer, Lord's Prayer. Just like that, all the way going through. So utilizing what the actual church building, uh, you know, suggests as part of the process. That's just an idea to give you a little bit of a, a picture of what I've been doing with my, my degree along the way. Art and church. We're going to ask some questions. These ones start out, they're rhetorical, but... Well, we're going to be thinking about this stuff. Why do we do what we do? When it comes to art in the church, what are our standards? Should we have standards? If we had standards as Lutherans, what would they be? What is art? operating a lot slower than I thought it was going to work. Okay, here we go. Um, things mean things. You know this. Uh, you might not think about this all the time, but you know it instinctively. Uh, there's a kind of a big field of study called semiotics, and you have a diagram there on the one side of the triangle. You've got the concept, you've got the object, and you've got the symbol. This is all operating up in your head all the time, everything you're looking at constantly. You're making analysis about all of these things. Uh, here on the other side, you have an image of uh, a piece of artwork called One in Three Chairs. And that's from 1965. It's kind of a conceptual art piece. And you have a description, a dictionary description of what a chair is. And then you have the actual chair. And you have a photograph of the chair. Very simple. You can kind of see how these things are all operating together. Maybe you were already starting to think of theology and practice and how all these things kind of go together. Okay, we're going to start off with Coca-Cola. You guys are aware of Coca-Cola. You may have had a long relationship with Coca-Cola throughout Pepsi's your whole entire life. What's that? Pepsi's better. Pepsi's better. Well, Pepsi doesn't have this particular problem, <laughs> the one we're going to look at today. Uh, so you're saying Coke's flawed? Uh, okay, we'll deal with that. Coca-Cola had a relationship developed with the World Wildlife Foundation. So they wanted to do something. They wanted to provide some money for polar bear conservation. We're going to watch a little bit of media connected to this. Maybe you're already aware of this. Okay, let's go to YouTube. And we're going to watch. A little video. A polar bear cub is born with no sense of sight. For the first few months of their lives, they completely rely on their mother's instincts and guidance for survival. But due to climate change, each year it's getting harder for her to care for the cubs that depend on her and care for herself. Her survival depends on the survival of the incredibly fragile Arctic environment, her home. We want the home of the polar bear to be a secure place, a place that can support them, a place where families can thrive. We're helping ensure the polar bears continue to have a future. Coca-Cola is working with World Wildlife Fund to support the Arctic home of the polar bear. 
As a symbol of our commitment, this holiday we're turning our red cans white and contributing $2 million over five years to WWF polar bear conservation efforts. We'll also match donations made at icope.ca. Coca-Cola learned a painful lesson all over again. Coke drinkers like it the way they like it, the way it's always been. That means taste and even the container it comes in. Coke is canceling the white holiday cans because they were just too confusing and unpopular with customers who thought they might contain Diet Coke and they swore that regular Coke tasted different in the white cans. It truly is the cost of good intentions. The polar bear cans are part of a $3 million charitable effort to benefit wildlife. You just can't mess around with Coke. <laughs> so a little bit of a problem there. A little disconnect between uh, the consumer and the producer. So here's the regular Coke can. There's the Diet Coke can. There's the new Coke can and the old Coke can. What they did was they had to change it from a white background with those little polar bears to a red background so people wouldn't be confused. So we're going to think about this along the way. This is going to be something that we want to keep, keep thinking about. Okay, from Martin Luther, from his writings, you can kind of deduce some principles uh, for making Christian art. Things that are distinct and useful for us. So we're going to look at these three principles. Ecclesiastical art must represent scriptural inerrancy and strive not to misrepresent, or misrepresent scripture. Ecclesiastical art must act as a witness to the faith and must act as a reminder and memorial, and in doing so, teach the people what it is to be a Christian while adhering to, firmly to the first principle. Ecclesiastical art must enhance worship in both its beauty and its adherence to the first two principles while not being an object of worship. It must be appropriate to its setting, respecting at all times the reception of the means of grace in word and sacrament ministry. Now these are all principles taken out of Luther's works. Uh, we'll start with the first one. While Luther didn't write a specific thesis on church or secular art, we were able to put together a picture of what he thought on the subject from a variety of his own writings from sermons, from biographical commentary, like the one on Abraham, from letters, from lectures, and from his anti-iconoclastic heavy work against the heavenly prophets from 1525. So we're going to kick things off with a, a uh, quote from Martin Luther, and it'll be on a topic that you will be familiar with. Okay, therefore, these gifts were not offered to Christ as the painters depict it, the one offering gold, the other incense, the third myrrh, but all of them as for one person offered all three things together. So there's a uh, quote from an Epiphany sermon from Martin Luther, and you've seen this in Christmas cards. You've probably even heard about it in sermons at different times. What scripture says is that there were wise men, which means there could be two or 2,000. <laughs> it, it, it's anything more than one, right? That's actually all scripture says. But people think to themselves, three gifts, three givers. <clears throat> Okay. 
Okay, so we got some, oh, go back there. We've got uh, some things to think about. The first thing there is an assumption. Three gifts, three givers. The second one that happens when it comes to scriptural inerrancy and troubles in transmitting scripture to people is genuine ignorance. Do you recognize this picture here? <clears throat> Probably not. That's Moses. What's unique about Moses in that picture? Horns. He's got horns. Right. This is a bit of a problem. Moses with horns is the result of a mistranslation that occurred when St. Jerome put together the Latin Vulgate. So he was looking at the Hebrew and, and uh, the Septuagint, and he was putting together the Latin Vulgate, and what he came across something, and he translated it as horns and not as rays. So you'll see other pictures of Moses where he's got like rays of light. You'll remember the passage talking about the veil being pulled down over his face because he was shining, right? This is a mistranslation of that. So what happens? Michelangelo, the same guy who painted the Sistine Chapel, he goes on what St. Jerome had done in his translation in the Vulgate and says, well, it says horns, so I'm making them with horns. And Michelangelo isn't the only one that did that. All through Europe you find statuary of Moses and drawings and paintings and things with him with horns. Now this is, would be genuine ignorance that caused that trouble. The last one is license. This is where things are inserted through via art into uh, the biblical narrative that aren't actually in the biblical narrative. For instance, there you've got the image of Veronica with the handkerchief. The tradition says she used to wipe Christ's face as he was going to the cross, and therefore there is an imprintation on there of Christ's face. So here's a little brand new Lutheran book that's been published, and it's actually by the mother-in-law of a pastor in Regina at Grace Luther Church. And her name is Carolyn Brinkley. And you might enjoy this at some point. It takes Albert Dürer, who's a Lutheran artist, takes all of his uh, woodcuts from this small passion and includes with it uh, little devotions along the way. Now, part of that small passion included a picture of Veronica with this handkerchief. So what does the Lutheran who publishes this do? Well, it's still in the book, but it's not in sequence. It's been put over in an appendix in the back of the book, separate. And here's the little picture. You can see it. It's got uh, Veronica. She's standing between Peter and Paul, <coughs> and she's holding this handkerchief. So the dutiful Lutheran woodcutter still made the image probably because he was a good businessman too. <laughs> <laughs> but how do we deal with it later on? She takes it out of the narrative because it's not part of the biblical narrative. <clears throat> we, she wouldn't want to misrepresent what scripture was teaching. Okay, here's another piece. You're probably familiar with it. This isn't the original. This is a derivative work from Leonardo da Vinci's 1495 painting. So this is contemporaneous with Luther. He would have known about this in his world. Uh, let's watch a little <coughs> sketch about this painting. <coughs> Good evening, Your Holiness. Evening, Michelangelo. I want to have a word with you about this painting of yours, The Last Supper. <laughs> oh, yeah? I'm not happy about it. Oh, dear. It took me hours. I'm not happy at all. Is it the jello you don't like? Good <laughs> Oh, no, they do add a bit of colour, don't they? Oh, I know, you don't like the kangaroo. 
<laughs> what kangaroo? No problem, I'll paint him out. I never saw a kangaroo. Uh, he's right at the back. I'll paint him out, no sweat, I'll make him into a disciple. Ah. <laughs> All right, that's the problem. What is? The disciples. Are they too Jewish? <laughs> Why Judas the most Jewish? No, it's just that there are 28 of them. <laughs> Oh, well, another one will never matter. I'll make the kangaroo into another one. No, that's not the point. All right, well, I'll lose the kangaroo. Be honest, I wasn't perfectly happy with it. That's not the point, but there are 28 disciples. Too many. Well, of course it's too many. <laughs> yeah, I know that, but I wanted to give the impression of a real Last Supper, you know, not just any old Last Supper. Not like a last meal or a final snack. But, you know, I wanted to give the impression of a real mother of a blowout, you know? <laughs> there were only 12 disciples at the Last Supper. Well, maybe some of the other ones came along. There were only 12 altogether. <laughs> well, maybe some of their friends came by, you know? Look, there were just 12 disciples and our Lord at the Last Supper. The Bible clearly says so. No friends? No friends. Waiters? No. <laughs> Cabaret? I've and got it. I've got it. We'll call it the last but one supper. What? Well, it must have been one. If there was a last one, there must have been the one before that. So this is the penultimate supper. <laughs> the Bible doesn't say how many people were there, now does it? No. Well, they are then. But look, the last supper is a significant event in the life of our Lord. The penultimate supper was not. Even if they had a conjurer and a mariachi band. <laughs> a last supper I commissioned from you and a last supper I want. With twelve disciples and one Christ. One? Yes. <laughs> now will you please tell me what in God's name possessed you to paint this with three Christs in it? <laughs> it works, mate. Works? Yeah. It looks great. The fat one balances the two skinny ones. <laughs> There's only one Redeemer. I know that. We all know that. What about a bit of artistic license? Well, one Messiah is what I want. I'll tell you what you want, mate. You want a bloody photographer. That's what you want. <laughs> a bloody creative artist. I'll tell you what I want. I want a last supper with one Christ, twelve disciples, no kangaroos, no trampoline acts. By Thursday lunch or you don't get paid. Bloody fascist. Look, <laughs> bloody pope I am! They don't know much about art, but I know what I like. <laughs> so the reason why that's funny <laughs> is because people know what's supposed to be in the Last Supper, right? They know what's supposed to be there. It's, this, this image is all over the place. The other reason that it's funny is because um, uh, people have this impression that the church is iron-fisted over these things. And there are reasons why we need to be very strict about, about how things are portrayed. It's important. Uh, here's the interesting thing about that little sketch that we just, uh, just saw there, is that it's actually based on something that really happened. It's not just something that some writers cooked up in a room. So you have here this painting called The Feast in the House of Levi from 1537, Paolo Veronese, an Italian fellow. And he made this uh, big, huge one with all sorts of people in it. And you have here on the one side, you've got uh, German soldiers. So the people of the day would have went, those are German soldiers. And on the other side, you see there's a little, little uh, comical dwarf in a uh, little uh, jester's outfit. Uh, there's a waiter there holding up a little plate, a little kid. Uh, there's some animals in it. There's all sorts of things in there that aren't normally supposed to be in the Lord's Supper. Now, when he was asked to do it, he was asked to do the Last Supper. And he just put all that stuff in because as an artist, that's what he did. He always put stuff in that wasn't supposed to be there. Well, he actually got called in by the Inquisition <clears throat> to be talked to about this. So this was for an Italian church in Italy, uh, a Roman <clears throat> church down there. And uh, they weren't so pleased. So in fact, that's when the new name was put on it. Because originally it was called the Last Supper. And then it had to be changed to, the, to this House of Levi uh, Supper instead because it was just outside the pale. 
So you see there somebody taking license with what is actually in Scripture. And I was going to say, uh, on the Last Supper, if you go to Cusco, the cathedral in Cusco, Peru, um, they, they also painted the Last Supper for them and uh, how they would do it. And so there's not a lamb shank on the table. There's a guinea pig, because they eat guinea pigs there. So if you go to Cusco, you'll see a guinea pig on the plate in front of Christ. Yeah. So here we have some things to think about. The artist who makes work, a work of art for a church building, particularly if it is to be viewed in connection to the divine service, must then strive to be careful to avoid contradicting scripture or misrepresenting scripture or embellishing the biblical account in such a way as to insinuate a false teaching either in a deliberate or subtle manner. Further to this, the pastor must take up the task to evangelically teach parishioners and artists when objects of art fall short of their noble work. <clears throat> Scriptural inerrancy within the congregation will likewise strengthen the church with wise and discerning laymen and laywomen. So imagine if you were to present a picture of the Last Supper with three Jesuses and 28 disciples, do you think your parishioners might say, but pastor, why are there three Jesuses and 28 disciples? They're, they're going to they're gonna notice that kind of thing. Now, when I say that you've got to evangelically work on this, I mean, you can be like this. You could say, like John Cleese is the Pope. You can say, Psh, out, right? Or you can actually teach why. And it's important to go the extra step and not just go, nope, get that out of here. Now, if it's inappropriate for worship, then you don't have to put it in there. But take the time to talk with the parishioners, with the artist. If you commission a piece of art for your church, take the time to spend time with the artist. Consider it like a regular call that you're going, like a shut-in call or any other kind of call you might do. That you're going to go and you're going to spend time with this guy or this woman and you're going to make sure she or he understands what it is you're trying to do and why the congregation wants it and how it's going to be used. Take the time to do that. So we're going to look at the second principle here. Second principle, ecclesiastical art must act as a witness to the faith and must act as reminder and memorial, and in doing so teach people what it is to be Christian while adhering still firmly to the first principle. If a religious image is not to be worshipped, what function can it maintain within a church? The answer is twofold. The function is witness and pedagogy, which is to teach. Okay, so here's another Luther quote. Images for memorial and witness such as crucifixes and images of the saints are to be tolerated. This is shown to be the case even in the Mosaic Law. And they are not only to be tolerated, Basically, he continues to say, and I'll paraphrase as this comes along here, but for the sake of memorial and witness, they are praiseworthy and honorable as the witness stones of Joshua and Samuel. So this is from Luther's work, it's from Church and Ministry. It's uh, <clears throat> from a particular thing that he wrote called Against the Heavenly Prophets. And uh, here we've got a pastor wearing a really big crucifix. Uh, some of you might know who that pastor is. That's a, that's a big one. I, I don't think I've seen larger crucifix than that worn on somebody. But this is a particular pastor who hammers home the point of preaching Christ and Christ crucified. That's the point you want to be getting across to people. Um, generally speaking, when people see a crucifix, What's the first thing they think of? Roman Catholic. Roman Catholic. Um, should maybe they be thinking Jesus? 
first? I don't know, but uh, we will talk about that in a little bit too. Let's take a break, stand up, and sing, Come Thou Font of Every Blessing. We're going to sing two verses of this. And I want you to listen for something, and maybe it'll clue in <coughs> at this point. We sing together. Come thou font of every blessing, to my heart to sing thy grace. Streams of mercy never ceasing, call for songs of loudest praise. While the whole of endless glory fills my heart with joy and Here I raise my Ebenezer, hither by thy help I've come, and I hope by thy good pleasure safely to arrive at home. Jesus sought me when a stranger, wandering from the fold of God, he to rescue me from danger. Interpose his precious blood. There we go. Please sit down. What uh, thing popped out there? Anything pop out at you? Ebenezer. Ebenezer. What kind of Ebenezer are we talking about here? Stone. Stone, not Scrooge. Right? This is a different kind of thing. So this is from Samuel. We have here uh, a little account. Then Samuel took a stone and set it up between Mizpah and Shen and called its name Ebenezer. For he said, Till now the Lord has helped us. So the Philistines were subdued and did not again enter the territory of Israel. And the hand of the Lord was against the Philistines all the days of Samuel. So here we have an example from Scripture. And this is the one that Luther goes to. He goes to this uh, section here particularly talking about how, in connection with art, art is a memorial. It's a witness to the faith. It's also a reminder of what happened in the past. So here's an example of a Ebenezer of sorts, a standing stone. There's lots of them. Uh, and sometimes they're a good thing, sometimes they're bad. You might remember a story about, uh, uh, you got Jacob, going off, running away from his brother Esau. There's the whole stairway to heaven, not the Led Zeppelin kind, but <coughs> the, the vision that he has in his dream. And then afterwards he takes the stone that he laid his head on and he turns it up and that is a place he calls Bethel. He anoints the stone. That's very pleasing to God. In other places, God says, don't have these things. Later on when they go into the land, uh, it became a practice of the Canaanites and God didn't want the people to be involved in them in the same way. So part of it is remembering something from Scripture. So do this in remembrance of me. That's a portion of what we do in Holy Communion. It's something that uh, Baptists, for instance, they focus in on that particular thing more than anything else. We focus in on that as well. But we don't only focus in on that. But that's part of what art can do within a congregation. It can help act as a reminder. The artist who makes works of art for a church building, particularly if it is to be viewed in connection with the divine service, must then strive to be careful to consider the reason for his work. What is it that is being remembered in the art? Is it a fit tool for teaching? Or is it so obscure that no one can make heads or tails of it? Can a pastor or layman or woman point to it and say, look, this means this. Or see how Jesus died for you on the cross. Once a work of art is made to reflect scripture accurately, then the question becomes, is the art good for teaching the faith and remembering our shared history? So it's not just enough that it's biblically accurate. It has to also be good for teaching and also for 
remembering what happened in the past. So here's the third point. Ecclesiastical art must enhance worship both in its beauty and in its adherence to the first two principles while not being an object of worship. It must be appropriate in its setting, respecting at all times the reception of the means of grace in word and sacrament <coughs> ministry. So you might remember, uh, and it came up not long ago, there was uh, Jesus talking to Nicodemus about being lifted up in the same way that uh, Moses lifted up the bronze serpent in the wilderness. Do you, anyone remember the whole story of that bronze serpent on the pole? You remember. Anyone else? I think they all get destroyed by Hezekiah. Eventually. Yes, exactly. And why does it get destroyed by Hezekiah? Because the Israelites were worshiping him. Exactly. Originally, it was not meant as an object of worship, but God did direct Moses to make it. He told him, make it, and make it like this. And then later, when it was being worshipped, then it had to go. So what normally do you see as works connected to the altar in a church? We're going to look at a couple here. We've got a Gothic style. That was very popular within Lutheran circles here about uh, 80 years ago. <clears throat> very popular. We've got uh, something more modernist looking. That became popular in the 60s and 70s. Uh, you'll notice that there you don't have um, a depiction of Jesus specifically. You have the empty cross there. And then lastly, you also get a scene of a crucifixion. So you get the crucifix there <clears throat> as well. Let's do a uh, show of hands. At the altar in your church, do you have a crucifix? Anyone? Do you? Okay. At the altar of your church, do you have a uh, bare cross? Okay. At the altar of your church, do you have an act like a statue of Jesus? So there is some variety there as well. Okay, so this is a Luther quote. Whoever is inclined to put pictures on an altar ought to have the Lord's Supper of Christ painted with these two verses written around it in golden letters. The gracious and merciful Lord has instituted a remembrance of his wonderful works. Then they would stand before the eyes of our hearts. Contemplate them with our hearts, even our eyes in reading would have to thank and praise God, since the altar is designated for the administration of the sacrament. One could not find a better painting for it. Other pictures of God or Christ can be painted somewhere else. This is uh, Martin Luther's uh, comment here, and it's during a discussion on Psalm, uh, one of the Psalms, 111 actually. How many of you have a picture of the Last Supper at your altar? Ooh, no hands. Uh, <clears throat> Psalm 111, verses 4 and 5. He has caused his wondrous works to be remembered. The Lord is gracious and merciful. He provides food for those who fear him. He remembers his covenant forever. This is where Luther bounces from this verse into that statement. So appropriate for contextual use. We're going to look at an, at an example of what uh, would not work. And then we're going to talk about why it doesn't work. All right. There we go. Tell me, why is this not working? Oh, there's so many reasons. <laughs> <laughs> Start listing them. What are the reasons? <clears throat> Wrong guy up there. 
wrong guy up there. Who is that? David. David. Is he a biblical figure? Yes. Yeah. Oh, so is he, you know, you know who that is, right? So you would look at that and go, oh, that's David. So what's wrong with that? It's the center of attention. Yeah, who's supposed to be the center of attention at, at the altar? Jesus. Jesus, not David. Uh, what other things would be inappropriate about that for a uh, worship setting? The way he's not dressed. <laughs> the way he's not dressed. Right, well, this is very true. Although you that could... Be more of a practical thing, but still. You, you could legitimately have Christ on the cross completely naked as well. You could. I wouldn't, though, in a worship setting. Maybe in a devotional setting, perhaps. Um, it, it glorifies the human body rather than the body of Christ. Yeah, and even if you extrapolated from that and it's the two natures of Christ, it can only be pointing to the one of the two natures there. And it would be a big leap and a lot of teaching to get there. Uh, it's, it's just not, not right. So in, that's pretty easy to, to figure out. Eh? You would get the impression that maybe what you're worshipping there is David and not Jesus. Okay, art is more than a material object. What it depicts and how it depicts it affects the viewer. <clears throat> Where and how it's displayed can also have an effect on perceived meaning. The viewer may be affected on a cognitive level or on a subconscious level, but it is telling them something. Art is also more than a painting or a sculpture or print or even a photograph. Art is also something that incorporates sound, time, space, movement, smell, light, and touch. <coughs> it is the very architecture of the building and how that interacts with the people congregated there in that place. Liturgy is art. And, you know, we'll use the word liturgy here, but liturgy is, everybody has liturgy. Have you been to a hockey game? Is there a liturgy to the hockey game? There is. What, what comes uh, first? National anthem. National anthem, right? Uh, and if you go to enough hockey games, you'll know, well, this is the time when they're going to uh, do this, and this is the time when they're going to do this. And you know that every 20 minutes there's going to be a break, and, you've, and there's people even wearing special outfits that let you know what's going on. <laughs> and, why, and why is that guy with stripes taking the other guy and putting him in the little thing on the side? There's all this stuff that is content to what you're doing. And you will find that in every variety of church as well. Organ music is a response. Exactly. So think about liturgy too, but what we do, there is this big piece of art that we're all working on and we're all collectively working on it together. It's a three-year cycle, and week in and week out, you are building this work of art. And if you jump in right for one day and you leave, it's harder to see the whole piece of art. If you're there regularly all along the way, you start to pick up on the big uh, image of what's happening. So we're gonna watch a little uh, brief chunk of something that I put on Moodle for you as well. How many of you guys had a chance to watch watch this on Moodle? Well, of you? Excellent. Moodle is a, uh, a little website they've got here. Buildings are total sensory experiences. 
too often because architecture involves objects. We tend to think of them as exclusively visual things. They're not. Next time we go to a religious service, start to pay attention to all five of your senses. Don't just look at the building, but listen to it, smell it. And there are even instances where we taste buildings, especially churches that have old masonry churches that begin to develop rising damp. You know, and you, you walk in and, and you can almost taste the mildew. Coming to church and attending a service is a multi-sensory experience. When people began arriving here in the middle of the 19th century, they were bringing a certain expectation about what a church was supposed to look like. Uh, came with a, a kind of architectural baggage of the, the motherland. And whether you built that in wood or masonry or tin or stucco, it didn't really matter very much. It was the form. You can read a building from the outside, what's going on on the inside. And in many instances, you can probably predict who's inside. Certainly, the Scandinavian churches have a kind of sparseness to them. I think if you go back to the history of the Scandinavian immigration, many of the people who came, especially from Norway, were Haugi Lutherans, and Haugi Lutheranism was a Lutheranism of deprivation. You know, it was learning how to find sanctity in having less rather than having more. And so all these Haugi Lutherans came here and built churches that were lean and spare and uh, stripped of ornamentation because from their theological perspective, ornament was sin. A pair of towers, either identical or mismatched, probably a pretty good indication of uh, that Roman Catholics are in there. Coming from Eastern Europe, most of the Eastern churches took as their pattern the Orthodox pattern of Eastern Christianity with domes of one sort or another that were not nearly as prominent in the West. And so here we have another ethnic group bringing a, an expectation with them what a church is supposed to look like. It's supposed to look like the ones back home. The building is, after all, a glove. And the hand that's in the glove are the people and the, the liturgical practice. The glove is going to take its form from the hand. And it's important as a people that we keep certain examples to remind us of where we've come from and how far we've come and how far perhaps we have yet to go. So if theology affects how people build their churches and what they do in those churches, all of this becomes public confession of faith. What do you think about this statement? The building is, after all, a glove, and the hand that's in the glove are the people and the liturgical practice. What do you think about that phrase? How about we let you think about that? We'll take a break. For about five minutes, how long do you usually break for? Ten. Ten minutes? You want a whole extra five minutes on top of the first five minutes? Sure, ten minutes. So think about Seven this. And Seven and a half. Oh, now we're haggling. We'll, we'll think about the building is, after all, a glove, and the hand that's in the glove are the people and the liturgical practice. Let's think about that, and we'll talk about it when we get back from our break. Please enjoy your break. Has presuppositions and they bring these to uh, church going experiences. Uh, they're deeply ingrained and learned over time. So, what we're going to do is we're going to have a couple quizzes for you. you it's a, a quiz. But before we do that, we're going to look at a series of images. And this can take a, a little bit of time to load up here. So, while it's getting ready, why don't. Uh, do you have any questions? Questions? Ready to go. Here we go. What is that? Coke. 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 That's trademark. That's right. How about that? Trademark. Trademarked also. McDonald's. 
How about that? Mercedes, Mercedes, Benz. Mercedes Benz. You guys are doing good. Apple. 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 Rotten fruit, <laughs> sorry. Rotten fruit. <laughs> <laughs> Nike. Nike. Oh, you're doing very well. There we go. We have some cupcakes there for you. Uh, there's the uh, Luther's uh, rose symbol on a couple cupcakes. How about that? Greek Orthodox. 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 Greek Orthodox. Orthodox. Yeah. <clears throat> Catholic, Roman Catholic, there you go. Is that a photo or is that a painting? That's a photograph. Really? Wow. Nope. Tried to go back. Didn't like it. Yeah, that's a photograph there. <clears throat> Who's in the photograph? John Paul. John Paul, yeah. How about this? Reformed. Reformed, right. That's Dutch Reformed right there. You see that cross with the triangle? Bam, that's Dutch Reformed. You'll see them around the city here. There's quite a few Dutch Reformed in Edmonton. <coughs> How about that? Pentecostal, yeah, there you go. We'll switch it up. Mormon. 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 Oh, you're doing very well. Islam. Islam, there you go. Here's your quiz. You got your options on the side. You got A, B, C, D, E, F, G. Start matching them up. C would probably be Anglican. C you think is Anglican. Okay, what else you got? G is Luke. G is Lutheran, okay. Continue. What else you got? D Pentecostal. D would be Pentecostal, okay. Continue on. <laughs> B is Baptist. B is Baptist, okay. B for Baptist. A would probably be United. A would be United, you figure, okay. Michael and I were saying that Dean is my church of Wetaskiwin. Dean is your church of Wetaskiwin. How did I get that picture? Any guesses on E? No, future Lutheran. Dean looks left. That one might be the United one. Okay. Calvinist. Calvinist. All right. Yeah. Okay, we're gonna do this is the second quiz. Alright, what do you got going on here? D looks like Roman Catholic. D looks like Roman Catholic. What else you got? So does G. So does G, okay. B looks Pentecostal. B looks Pentecostal, okay. E is Baptist. E is Baptist. So the potluck on the day? The potluck on the C looks Lutheran. C looks Lutheran? <coughs> it's 
kids are raising their hands, that's why. <laughs> kids are raising their hands. <laughs> How about F? A is united. A is united. And F? What about F? One very large party. One very large party. Yeah, that's the rave I went to on the weekend. <laughs> the rave you went to on the weekend. <laughs> okay, so we're just going to go back and then we'll, we'll look at this. That's what I said, Keith. <laughs> the rave on the weekend? So my girls go to every Friday night. Yeah. Okay. They're all Lutheran. No. It's all of them. No. Every single last one. <coughs> Not LCC. Not all LCC. <laughs> or right? They're not all LCC, but they are all Lutheran. So it is your church. I haven't been up to Alaska in a while. We only do that in the summer, though. <laughs> okay, D up there. That is Redeemer in Fort Wayne, Indiana. And uh, that, I think, is the installation of their pastor, yeah. Pastor Peterson, yeah. there, right? G yeah. is from Sweden, and that's a Lutheran church in Sweden. Okay, so it'd be a bishop. Yeah. Yes, yeah. Okay. Uh, that's just some of them I'll point out there. Of course, C looks like your average Lutheran church, maybe, quote-unquote average. But these are all... F and that other big one on the other page, those were youth gatherings. There was one from Texas there uh, recently at the, in the uh, LCMS. Sneaky, I know, it was sneaky. Kind of like when the Muslim guy came in and gave us all those quotes from the Bible and they were all from the Quran. <laughs> is, it, is it from the New Testament or the Old Testament? <laughs> Okay, <laughs> so clearly there is some variety within Lutheranism in terms of how we do things. Let's uh, talk about strengths to this approach and weaknesses to this approach. So what do you think in terms of strengths? Well, according to these pictures that you have up above, they're <laughs> straight down the middle of the road and there's in the ditch on either side. <laughs> well, you definitely could go that direction with this. So what do you think? What would be the strengths to having such variety? Um, yeah, all things to all people. And you have uh, opportunity to share the gospel. You have uh, a medium that appeals to everybody. Your church, particular worship style, doesn't suit someone and can send them down the road to the next Lutheran church. Okay, there, that may be uh, strength. What else do you got for strengths? That was interesting. Your first picture almost suggests that there's a suggestion of capitalicity there, in the sense that I mean, I would pick some of those vestments, for example. Uh, I would have called them reformed, looking, right? You know, mm -hmm. so just and, and some of them more Roman Catholic, yeah, in appearance. So, so in a strange way, there's sort of a suggestion of a broader connection to the broader church. Mm -hmm. in, in some of those choices. So that would be the doctrine of the universal church, right? that, you know, kind of visually displayed that, you know, we do fit in, in some ways, all through everything. Uh, how about weaknesses to this approach? Because this is the general approach within Lutheranism today around the world. So what would be the weaknesses in this approach also? We're not sure who we are. A little bit of an identity crisis there, right? Not 100% sure exactly who we are at any given time. If you are a Orthodox person, right? Not, you know, Genesio Lutheran style, but just Orthodox, and you show up in a uh, community, can you find the church that you want to go check out pretty fast, right? You don't even need a phone book, you just drive around, look out the window, bam, I'm going to go to that one very confusing if you walk in there and uh, the church has been sold to a Pentecostal group and they just like the building. <laughs> you might have a moment where you're like, what's going on here? <laughs> uh, so you see that there is maybe some weakness in not having some sort of unifying thing. What would you say was, not, not 
100%, but generally speaking, the most unifying thing that we have as Lutherans in Lutheran Church Canada in terms of connecting us all together in an uh, artistic way. Maybe the liturgy? The liturgy. Specifically what? Word and sacrament. Mm, still not quite there yet. Specifically... The hymn book? Yeah, the hymn book. That would be the most unifying object that we have. Now, we have these in the pews at Mount Olive, but we rarely ever crack them open. <clears throat> but we use them every Sunday because we have the Lutheran service builder and we present the service via PowerPoint. It's, it's all exactly, even the music is all up on the screen. And even the, the font, you know, the LSB symbol font that gives you the C's and the A's and the P's and the little crosses, it's all the same. It looks just like the hymnal, but it's up on the screen. That's one way that you can do it. You can use that same program to print out a bulletin that's got the entire service published inside it. You can use the hymnal as well. Content is the same, right? There's also creative worship. We use that sometimes as well. Other congregations use that. Uh, are you free to do other things? Sure. Guys in the end of uh, program, you're going to be thinking about what are your investments going to look like. You saw yesterday I was here, I was uh, <coughs> preaching for the chapel. What kind of investments what, were I, was I wearing? Classic and surplus. Classic and surplus, right. Now, not everybody wears that. What's the more common one for Lutheran Church Canada? All. All. Now, if you went back 80 years ago, what was the common vestment? Black gown. Geneva gown. Or, or what? Suit and tie. That was the other one. So, suit and tie, Geneva gown, all cassock and surplus. What goes along with the all, usually? Let's say you're presiding over Holy Communion, you're leading the service. What else might you wear? Stole. Stole? Sure, yeah, of course. If you're a pastor, you're going to wear a stole. Chasuble? Chasuble, right. So a lot of times, Lutheran pastors will just be wearing the all. They don't even own a chasuble. There's a couple reasons for that. Sometimes they're cost prohibitive reasons. Because some of those chasubles can cost upwards of two and a half grand for one. And you get them in all the different liturgical colors of the season, right? So it can be a big investment. Some congregations will buy those and they belong to the congregation. So the pastor shows up and it's kind of like, uh, this may sound a little crass, but basically what they do is they've got their, their liturgical poncho here, right? And the new pastor shows up and blink, there he is. He takes a call and leaves. The next pastor comes and plink, there he is. He takes a call, the next pastor comes and plink, there he is. Right, so that congregation has uniformity over a stretch of time based on these chasubles. And that can be chasubles with the stores and the whole, whole bit. You show up with your, your all, and you just kind of get in there with the next guy. Hopefully the guy before you was a little bigger than you are, so it's not too tight, but that's why they make chasubles like ponchos, right? There's a lot of room there for a variety of different shapes of pastors. So there, we, we do have, these. sometimes they can be a strength, like you were saying, that they could be, uh, you know, appealing to a wide variety of different people. And then the other times it can be uh, a bit of a weakness because Maybe it's not fully doing those three principles. Maybe it's not completely teaching exactly what Lutheranism teaches in all of its facets. Now, of course, a t thing can't teach all by itself. The pastors have to be involved in doing the teaching, too. So we're going to take our books of Concord that I asked uh, the students to bring. The rest of you have it memorized, I'm sure. 
Uh, we're going to uh, look specifically at Article 15. Actually, I put the wrong article up there. We are going to look at Article 7 eventually, and we're going to look at Article 15. Let's start with Article 15. This is Article 15 of the Augsburg Confession. Now, those of you that uh, have brought a pen, because I also asked you to bring a, a writing utensil, um, I want you to, in a moment, mark this. It's okay. Don't be precious. You can, you can mark your, your books. All right, Article 15. <clears throat> the Augsburg Confession was written in advance of the audioferistic controversy, which blossomed out of the conclusion of the Small Called War of 1546 and the ensuing 1548 Augsburg Intro. How many of you guys have done confessions? Okay, excellent. Um, now, the Augsburg Confession was pulling together for Charles V, who was the emperor of the Holy Roman Empire at the time, uh, what Lutherans confessed to be true, and also what uh, Lutherans can do in worship and daily life would all be in part of the Augsburg Confession. So we're going to look at this article now. It's not too long, but I want you to uh, mark in it, just right in the margin or the top, you can write on it, um, art in the church. Just, just, put that, just put that right in there. Okay, so here's the article. Our churches teach that ceremonies ought to be observed that may be observed without sin. Also ceremonies and other practices that are profitable for tranquility and good order in the church, in particular holy days, festivals, and the like ought to be observed. Yet the people are taught that consciences are not to be burdened as though observing such things was necessary to salvation. They are also taught that human traditions instituted to make atonement with God, to merit grace, and to make satisfaction for sins are opposed to the gospel and the doctrine of faith. So vows and traditions concerning meats and days and so forth instituted to merit grace and to make satisfaction for sins are useless and contrary to the gospel. <coughs> so what do you think about that? Three principles are in there. The three principles are in there. Excellent. Okay, we're going to, you know where I'm going. Okay, the first principle, ecclesiastical art must represent uh, respect scriptural inerrancy and strive not to misrepresent, misrepresent scripture. Article 15. Strongly desires to keep celebrations, festivals, and the like focused on the salvation found in Christ. And the article also refutes the erroneous teaching that human tradition can act to win God's favor, merit grace, or make satisfaction for sins. This article indicates that sticking to the core teaching of scripture without a revision or addition is the aim of the worship service and that we are to work to maintain this clarity in our services. So if you're teaching everybody you cannot be saved by works and your entire worship service in all of its parts and the building you're in and everything around you is teaching people you are saved by works, what do you have going on? You're at cross purposes with each other. I'll give you a, a small example of how this could, could happen. Now this is maybe, some will say, nitpicky. But, okay, do you guys have a kitchen table? Yes, okay, good. Some of you may be in apartments where you don't have the luxury of a kitchen table. You maybe have a coffee table that you eat at. <laughs> okay, so you have a table that you eat at. Uh, you could have a, 
a wooden table, like an oak table, nicely finished, right? Or you could have a table with maybe an arborite kind of Formica style thing on there that looks like oak. But it isn't, is it? No. This is something called simulacra. Have any of you guys been to Disneyland? <coughs> yeah, no, no, yes? Oh, yes. Disneyland is almost entirely simulacra, right? You know, when you go to the Old West part, that's not really the Old West. It's all simulated. It's all, have you, any of you, any, any of you guys had a car with wood paneling that was wood, right? Because well, most of the time it's simulacra. It's not real. So if something is not real, only kind of looking real, would that be a problem? So let's say you've got your sanctuary and you have all of your altar, uh, your altar, your pulpit, your lectern, <coughs> your baptismal font, all of the things in there that are your chancel furniture. And it is all covered in arborite to look like marble. It's fake. All right, so it's fake. You know it's fake. Congregation knows it's fake. Everybody knows it's fake. They know it's fake just as fast as they know that that's McDonald's over there, that that's a Nike shoe, that uh, all of that kind of stuff. They know, bam, like that. So here you are at the pulpit preaching what? The truth. And everything around you is screaming, fake. Could that be a problem? Now, is that a problem for everybody cognitively? Are they all aware of it all the time? No. Some of them may, at times, like a submarine, pop up with their periscope and go, hey, wait a minute, look at that. Most of the time, it's going to be subconscious, right? It's going to be affecting them subconsciously. So what would be the solution? Get rid of it. Get rid of it. <laughs> Get real. There you go. Maybe put in real things instead of fake things. Why do people use fake things? Because they like things fake? It's easier. Cheap. Cheaper and easier. <laughs> this is a struggle, right? If you are involved in a building project, if you are involved in a renovation, if you are involved in anything like that, you are going to come up against, but pastor, it's cheaper and it really doesn't matter, right? That's what you're going to come up against. Can I kind of play devil's advocate? Sure. I mean, you, you talked about this sanctuary where it was arborite to look like stone or whatever. Right. Sitting in the pew, how would you necessarily know that it was fake had nobody told you it was fake? With your eyes. <laughs> when you go for communion and you're actually only two feet away at the altar rail, you are going to see it. When you're working on the altar guild and you are lovingly putting out Holy Communion, you are going to see it. When you are an usher and you come to get the collection plates, you are going to see it. When you're a little kid and you're coming up for the kids' message, you are going to see it. When you are an elder and you're helping with Holy Communion, you are going to see it. And when you're the pastor, you're going to see it. If you're a lay reader, you're going to see it. Everybody is going to see it. They're all going to be close to it. There's a baptism. Afterwards, they come to the front. They take a photograph with the pastor, and they're all standing right there. They're going to see it. They will see it. Pastor Fritch. Ted, isn't the same thing happening when, when churches <coughs> put these real trite sayings on bulletin boards outside of their, their uh, yes. church? Or inside the church, well, on a banner, let's say. Yeah, which, which really, you know, like whenever I see something like this, there are some really good messages. Yes. Yeah. But it just cheapens the, the, the whole Christian message. Of that, yeah. Or let's that. say it's a funeral, and the family has gone to the funeral home, 
and they have, in consultation with the funeral director, picked out a, I don't know, the farmer's home, and put it on the back of the little, uh, little slip with the photograph of the fellow who's died. And now it's working counter-purpose to everything you're preaching in the sermon. But pastor, these things don't matter. Well, actually, they do. Now, I'm not telling you that you have to go out and be a tyrannical dictator. What I'm telling you is you've got to go out and be a teacher. You actually have to teach people. And you have to think to yourself, i got to look around and see what this is all saying. What is it actually saying? What are people going to read? Now, everybody's a little different, and there is a big area for subjectivity. But, like David on the altar, there are some no-brainers <coughs> along the way that you can avoid. And maybe it's the, how do we get rid of the banner that's trite and any, I don't know, welder, you know, who, who comes and uh, comes to the church and sits all day welding and sees this trite thing on the wall and says, oh man, this place is not for me. How do you get rid of that, that trite banner? Maybe you get rid of it by saying, you know what would be really nice? Why don't you and I, to some person you know in the congregation who can make a banner, sit down and make some new banners? Wouldn't that be an exciting project? Right? Now, what are you going to run into if you do that? Aunt Mabel. Aunt Mabel. <laughs> Grandma Schmidt made that original banner, and now it's a problem. Because we can't possibly defend <coughs> Grandma Schmidt's memory, because she died 80 years ago, but her family come every once in a while for baptism, and they love that. It's even got a little label with her name. <laughs> it's even got a label with her name on it. So yes, that can be very difficult. It can be very difficult. That's why originally I said, you've got to do this evangelically. You've got to do this gently. You've got to take your time. These things don't all get done overnight. It takes time to refine what is going on in your congregation. So, you know, maybe it needs to go to a place of honor, separate from the worship uh, service and sanctuary. Maybe there is a rotation. You know, maybe it needs to be lovingly uh, enshrined somewhere else. But you want to focus in on what the entire worship service is doing from beginning to end. All of the parts, all the moving parts. Okay, we'll go on to the second uh, principle here. <clears throat> if we, there we go. Ecclesiastical art must act as a witness to the faith and must act as a reminder and memorial, and in doing so, teach the people what it is to be a Christian while adhering still firmly to the first principle. Article 15 insists that. The, cons uh, the conscience of the individual need not be burdened with the belief that worship uh, that is contradictory to scripture should be seen as necessary for salvation. In other words, the very service itself must act as a reminder that we do not merit our salvation and furthermore it should then strive to teach that the work of Christ accomplishes salvation, not the work of men. So, <coughs> Do you have various different uh, practices in a congregation that are different from other ones? We've already talked about this variety, right? Let's say that the congregation you came from when you were a kid, people stood until every candle was put out, right? And another guy, another classmate, let's say, went to a church where everybody sat down and then the candles were put out. Now you guys both end up in the same congregation and there you are and it comes to the end of the service, the pastor says, please be seated and the candles are put out. Which one's happy? We're all happy because it's Eddie Afro. <laughs> <laughs> that, you might think, is the case. However, 
what do human beings do? We're all happy. <laughs> all the time. All it's happy worship. all the time. It's worship service, Pastor Jesus. We're all happy. <laughs> We're all happy. Do I have to take control? <laughs> Somebody, the one who went to the church where the candles were lit and put out, and then the people sat down, that's the one that's going to be unhappy. That's not how it's always been done. Right. It's very fun But that is not necessary for salvation, and therefore it is adiaphora, and we'll talk a little bit more about adiaphora, but just a little bit, because we don't have that much time. But here we have this thing where the actual confession, the Augsburg Confession, Article 15, is saying that people shouldn't be burdened if it's not something that's connected to salvation. Just They should not have to have that burden. So evangelically and, and, and lovingly, if that person was having a problem with the fact that people sat down before the candles got put out, what would the pastor need to do? Spend some time with them and teach them, right? Mention that, hey, is your salvation in jeopardy because these candles are being put out while people are sitting down? No, okay. Remember that. Okay, three. Ecclesiastical art must enhance worship in both its beauty and in its adherence to the first two principles while not being an object of worship. It must be appropriate to its setting, representing at all times the reception of the means of grace in word and sacrament ministry. Okay, so Article 15, as to context, in the wider sense, the article is dealing with church rites, worship, uh, holy days and festivals, all of which are centered around the church building and or corporate Christian community as the location for the activities. How many uh, of your guys' congregations have a Good Friday service? How many of you have the Tannenberg service? How many of you use the Chief service? Both. Um, Ash Wednesday. <coughs> How many of you use... Uh, how many of you have Ash Wednesday services? All right. How many of you use the imposition of ashes? Ah, not everybody. How many have communion on that night? On a Wednesday? On a Wednesday even, in the evening, at the church. A couple hands. Uh, so, again, you know, this, is, this art, article of the Augsburg Confession is dealing with the fact that, you know, we don't necessarily have to all have the exact same thing happening all the time. Oh, every single church doesn't need to have it at 10 o'clock in the morning or 7 p.m. at night, right? But at the same time, it needs to be appropriate. So let's say that your church decided that you're going to have Good Friday on July 20th. How would the rest of the church feel about that, the other congregation? Well, that goes against scripture in a sense because Good Friday is connected to Easter which is usually at a specific time in the year and in the church year so there'd be an issue there'd be an issue so yes sometimes there could be an issue if you go too far imagine if you, when you were little little kids did you um, did you ever have those little coloring books right and what do you do with a coloring book? Color. Color. And inside the line. Inside the line. <laughs> right. <laughs> if everybody go, goes inside the lines, is everybody happy? There's always somebody who wants to go just outside the line. But if they go just outside the line, is it okay? Yeah. If they go all the way outside the line, to some people look and go, that kid's eating too much paste. <laughs> <laughs> so you can have variety here. As long as they stay on the paper. As long as they stay on the paper. They're off the paper, they're on the wall, they're going down the hallway. It's a bit of a problem. For the true unity of the church, so now this is Article 7. So I want you to go to Article 7. Now this is going to be probably the most helpful one for you. In Article 7, has this line in it, and you can even you can even underline this line. Don't get crazy. Stay inside the underlining of the line. But here we go. Article seven. <coughs> Our churches teach that only that the one holy Christian 
uh, let me start from the beginning. Our churches teach that one holy church is to remain forever. The church is the congregation of saints in which the gospel is purely taught and the sacraments are correctly administered. For the true unity of the church, it is enough to agree about the doctrine of the gospel and the administration of the sacraments. It is not necessary that human tradition, that is, rites and ceremonies instituted by men, should be the same everywhere. As Paul says, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all. So if you have a uh, Monday, Thursday service and another church doesn't, it's not the end of Christendom. If your congregation has uh, the ten embrace service and you use seven candles that you put out during the readings and another church does it and they use five, it's not the end of Christendom. It'll be okay. So if you, if you need assurance anywhere about the variety, there it is. Now here's the thing. We are also in synod, so we decide to walk together. So the kid that's eating the paste way outside of the lines, down the hall, drawing on the wall, that can get people a little edgy, right? Now, in the context of synod, what do you need to do? Do you drop on that guy like a ton of bricks? Or do you evangelically take the time to preach and teach and spend time with the person and talk about these things? What do you do? Call the Don. <laughs> Call the Don. <laughs> you bring him up in charges. And you, right, that's what you do. No, you, you spend time. You're going to have your winkles. You're going to have opportunities. You're going to have conventions. You have places where you can talk about this. You can talk about it on Facebook. In fact, the other day, there was a big discussion about taking shut-in communion to people and how is that done. And there was probably about 20 different pastors from Lutheran Church Canada all going back and forth, talking about this, going to the early church fathers, going to the different spots in the confessions, talking about it from scriptural point of view, from the practical element of it, from the way it fits in with the office of the ministry and the understanding of that. And they're talking about it together. And nobody's dropping uh, giant uh, tons of bricks on anyone. Might it happen? Could you be the person who gets your hand slammed in the car door? Yes. Now, if you're drawing way outside the lines and you're down the hall and you're eating the paste, let's say, let's say you're not eating the paste. They just think you're, they just think you're eating the paste. You're not actually eating the paste. You're, you're, you're a very good Lutheran kid. You really are. It's absolutely the case. But you are doing something that's down the hall and it's not on the paper and it's not on the lines. And somebody gets mad at you for doing it like that. Should you maybe expect that they would? And might you also have to try evangelically to teach why you're doing what you're doing? It has to be a dialogue. <clears throat> There's not going to be one way of doing it. Okay, so in Christian freedom, could our pastors dress like this? Yes. Yes, they could. Um, why would we not do this? <laughs> Probably not a good idea. <laughs> it would be what? Confuse people. Confusing. Mm -hmm. Right? So are you seeing what I'm saying? That there is this kind of middle road. And that there is a ditch on the one side and there's a ditch on the other side. And you need to kind of stay in the middle and you need to kind of stay together. Now does that mean that Lutheran Church Canada should pick a specific color of clergy shirt and use that? only, like a nice uh, royal blue color or something with navy slacks. Do, do we want to do that? No. We could do that. So we don't have women pastors. Oh, we don't have women pastors. So we don't need We don't need royal blue. There you go. <laughs> um, Just blue? When you go on calls, let's say Pastor Fritchie, if you go on a call, and you are dressed like you are dressed right now, you will go to the hospital, right? You will go pretty much directly to the room of the person that you're visiting. You will visit that person, give them Holy Communion, 
you will get to your car and drive back to your office or your home or to the church or wherever you're going. Unless somebody recognizes what? Your face, right? Now, if you go there and you're dressed like this, what are the odds that you could also end up doing something you hadn't expected? Pretty great. Pretty great. You will find that if you go to the hospital and you've got a shirt and tie on, they may go, doctor, right? Because you might look like a doctor. Also may do something you weren't expecting. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> She's having the baby right now. Um, if you go like this, you're going to be asked to do things that you didn't expect on it. Right? So there's been lots of times when I've gone to the hospital and looked like this, and then people will say, my mother is dying. Please come pray with her. And, I, and, they'll, and they'll start it by saying, Father, my mother is dying. Please come pray with her. And then you say, I'm a Lutheran pastor. And then they say, it's okay. <laughs> <laughs> the priest hasn't been around. Please come. <laughs> and then you sit and you pray with the lady and you get to the end of your prayer and you, you say, you know, all these things we pray in Jesus' name who taught us to pray, our Father who art in heaven. And all of a sudden the woman who's dying chimes right in and then she kind of trails off after and deliver us from evil. Because <laughs> the rest is not normally what she's used to, let's say. Maybe in her congregation where she's from. But even this tells people something. So all of the stuff in your little church that you're going to end up at, or your big church that you're going to end up at, is all talking and doing stuff. It's all art. right? And you're going to find that there's you know, amateur art, fine art, there's craftsmanship, right? And then there's, you know, a honey-do list <coughs> style uh, workmanship that you might find on some things. Should, when it comes to art and the way the church is set up and <coughs> where the liturgy is, and the, way the worship is, and the way that the life, the congregation around these things are, just think of it this way. However it is when you arrive, work to try to leave it better than you found it, if you can. And when people say, but pastor, it costs a lot of money, then you can say, well, maybe we need to take time to work on raising the money. Because a well uh, thought out sanctuary can teach what scripture teaches without there being anybody there. Think of it this way. If you had a church, in fact, I, I can think of this. There's a fellow named Fawaz who works in the city here. And he went to a church in Baghdad. And it's a, it's a Catholic church there. And you might remember this, that it was uh, right around New Year's, I think it was. And uh, this was a couple years ago. And the group connected to Al-Qaeda went in and they killed almost everybody there. They killed the priests, they shot people, there's blood on the walls, people, like, priests had their heads cut off. Terrible. If you're the Al-Qaeda guy who just went in there and did that, and you're standing in there with your gun or your machete or whatever you've used to kill all these people, the very room itself should be saying, this is what Christians believe. Because those people can't say it anymore, they're dead. If you're going to build a church from scratch, I've often thought of this. Take that baptismal font. You make it out of concrete. You rebar it into the foundation of the building. And you can clad it nicely with, with uh, marble or with whatever, whatever you want on there. And then on it, you put in an Arabic, Chinese, French, Russian, whatever languages you need to, baptism now saves you. You put it on there. You put scripture right on there. So that one day in the future, let's say that uh, that congregation has all been called to glory. Or a war has occurred and they've all been called to glory or they've been moved somewhere else 
and that's being repurposed into a mosque, right? Let's say, just for instance. And they go, well, we don't really need a baptismal font here. We're going to have to get rid of this. Let's move it. Yeah, get out the jackhammer. And as they're jackhammering the baptismal font out and they're doing that, they read, baptism now saves you the whole entire time. The building itself can also teach what scripture teaches. And you want to make sure that it's teaching it accurately, that it's um, actually a witness to what Christians believe, and that it's appropriate for the place. So no David's on the altar. You know, you want to make sure that what's happening in that spot, that the, the art around the baptismal font is about baptism. The art around the altar is about the Lord's Supper. Kind of think about it in that kind of way. These are the principles that you can derive from what Luther wrote. And you can see that it's connected to the Augsburg Confession as well. And there's a couple other spots there too. So while we have freedom, in art it's important to consider what we do and why we do it. Okay, we're going to take some questions. We have about 10 minutes. And then afterwards, we'll have a little prayer and we'll be done. So do you have any questions, anything you'd like to ask? Now that I've thrown a whole pile of stuff at you. Yeah, Jeff. It's okay, I've been right where you are. <laughs> You're thinking to yourself, I don't know what to ask. Well, the one thing that, because us students had to do reading before this, um, and iconoclasm, how do we deal with that? I know within our Lutheran circles it's not such a big deal, but you're talking about putting altar on the altar and, you know, stuff like this, and it's okay, but how do we deal with not going too far? Not going too far. <clears throat> that people end up worshipping the beauty of that art instead of who they really should be worshipping. Okay, the, the long answer to your question is read that against the heavenly prophets. It's in Luther's works. That is your go-to source to deal with this particular question. Because Luther was at the Wartburg, he was doing the translation, he was Yonker, George with his big beard, and he was hiding out, and one of his fellow professors, who was part of the <coughs> Reformation, Karlstadt, was back in Wittenberg, and he was kind of <coughs> taking the bull by the horns, and he was taking the vestments off the pastors, the priests, he was breaking all of the, the sculptures, he was knocking out the stained glass windows, he was getting rid of the pyramids, everything, just psh, psh, psh. he didn't want to have any of that. Luther heard about this, and that's where you get this against the heavenly prophets from. And if you remember that Martin Luther movie that came out not long ago, there was a little section in there about that, and Luther kicks Karlstadt out of town. Right? He's like, boo, you're out, you're gone. Not particularly evangelical of him, <laughs> but if you find out the whole story there, Karlstadt goes around, he's a wandering uh, itinerant preacher, Eventually, he runs out of money, he's down on his luck. Where does he end up? Sleeping on Luther's couch at his country house on the farm. That's where Karlstadt ends up. They patch things up, right? It takes a little bit of time. In the movie, you just see the first part where he gets booted out of town, right? But that's the go-to thing. You read that against the heavenly prophets, that's important. Luther kind of comes at it like this. He says, if you've got somebody in the pew that's been there for all of these years, and they've been lovingly involved in this, you've got to teach them about it, right? Because if you just break the statue and throw it away, you've not gotten at what's in their heart. They could still have that same idol in their heart. You need to work on teaching them, and then when it's not in their heart anymore, it doesn't matter if it's before the rise. Master Fritchie. Well, I just, uh, any thoughts about how you would go about introducing uh, a crucifix 
in the congregation. Well, maybe you could be like that one pastor and just wear a big one right around your... <laughs> <laughs> okay, this is interesting because at uh, Mount Olive when I got there, no crucifix anywhere. None. And that's typical. It's not unusual, right? Um, we had a guy in the congregation who was making little crosses to give to people when they were getting baptized, right? And he made one for me with with the corpus on it. And he gave it to me as a present because I was new in the church. And uh, he, and actually what he did is he had two. He had one without and one with. And he came to me and he said, Pastor, which one would you like? And I said, I'll take the one with, the, with Jesus on it. So I took that. And he says, well, I make these all the time for baptisms. Do you think that we should have the Jesus on, on, the, on the ones we give out for the baptisms? I said, sure. So we made up about 20 of them. And then at the baptisms, we just gave them to the family as a gift. And then when we ran out of those, we made some more. And I put one up in my office. And then I put one up in one of the meeting rooms that we have in the church. And that's pretty much what we've done. Now, Deaconess Pam Nielsen was up from St. Louis. And she was getting a tour of the church. And she asked, she said, Where's your congregation's crucifix? So, well, we don't have one in the sanctuary. But we have one <coughs> here in this room. We've got one in my office. And we give them out at baptisms. So you've got to start somewhere, right? Maybe it does start with wearing it, having one as your pectoral cross. Maybe it starts there. Maybe it starts by just putting one in your office if you don't already have one in there. Now, if your church never ends up having one at the front of the church, is that the end of the world? No, it's not. If the people in the church end up worshipping it like they were worshipping the bronze serpent on the pole, you, like Hezekiah, should do what? Take it out. Because if they go, if you show up at the new congregation that you're being sent to, and they say, Pastor, you have to see this crucifix we have Whenever we pray to it, it we good things happen for our congregation. <laughs> and you've got a lot of teaching to do. You've got a whole pile. If they say it cries blood and check it out, you better go back there and make sure some of the got a little tube and like <laughs> Because that's one of the things that was happening during the medieval period, and Luther talks about this kind of stuff. He said that there were like statues of the Virgin Mary that were made up to be like a little dummy so that there could be somebody sitting in behind and answering the person's prayer and moving the mouth in the dim, dim room that they had it in at the church, right? So if you think that these things couldn't happen again, they can, right? It's, uh, you know, Jesus in a piece of toast or stuff. You know, you do want to avoid that stuff. I, I guess I'd, I'd make a comment, Ted, about, about ecclesiastical art that a friend of mine, a uh, Roman Catholic friend, talked about the poor and the cult of pragmatism in the West, <coughs> that uh, often we think that our resources in the church should not be directed toward uh, art or beauty or aesthetics, but rather should be you know, directed to social concerns, to spreading the gospel in very pragmatic ways. <coughs> And, and uh, on the mission field, uh, a missionary went and talked to people about this and said, why don't we, you know, we won't bother to fix the cathedral. And we, what we'll do instead is we'll use the money to, to help you to feed your families, et cetera, et cetera. And all the poor people objected as strongly as they could object and said, this is the only place that reminds us that we belong somewhere else than the drudgery of our daily lives and that when we die, we will be there in eternity. Yeah. So these things, the, the Western pragmatic mindset isn't the only way to look at things. Exactly the case. Uh, we do live in a, you, you don't feel it all the time, but we're still hacking out an existence in the wilderness here. People haven't been here for very long. So there is this kind of frontiersman <coughs> mentality. However, what Pastor Van Wilder is saying is absolutely true. When I was a little kid and I grew up in Stony Plain, Alberta, and there was only 3,000 people there, 
at the time. It's much bigger now than it was then. The, apart from the grain elevators that both sat on either side of the meridian, the fifth meridian, the, the, those grain elevators aren't there anymore, but besides those two grain elevators, the biggest, tallest, most <coughs> majestic thing in that town was St. Matthew Lutheran Church. You walked in there, ceilings were high, bigger than you would have in your own house. It was, it was beautiful. And it was like that. This was the place where the people of God congregated together. And they were part of not just their little congregation there, but something bigger. So that is definitely part of, of the whole thing. So one other thing to paraphrase Walther, wherever you get your call, this is a huge paraphrase, wherever you get your call, wherever you're sent, that's your little chunk of heaven. Appreciate it, love it, do your work there, right? But after that, while they're there, make sure you leave it better than you found it. And teach the people. And it's okay to have beautiful and nice things. It's all right. Just make sure that they teach what Scripture teaches accurately, that they are a reminder of who they are as Christians and that they're good for teaching, and that uh, it's contextually proper for it to be there. Those are the three things to remember. So hopefully that's been helpful to you in thinking about art and the church here in uh, your context. So we will close with the Lord's Prayer. Please rise. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Thank you very much for having me, and uh, hope you have a good day. Thank you, Ted, for sharing uh, this with us. It's been thought-provoking and uh, hopefully helpful.